major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, it's Thursday, December 10th. Thanks for joining us, I'm Maya Trabulsi. We've all been waiting for it now. A major step forward getting Americans a COVID-19 vaccine. An advisory committee to the Food and Drug Administration endorsed Pfizer's vaccine, concluding it appears safe and effective. A final FDA decision is expected within days. San Diego County is also working on its plans for the anticipated rollout Nadia Romero has more on how long it could be before the shots are widely available. With the FDA advisory committee voting to approve the emergency use authorization, it now heads to the CDC. Their advisory board will vote on Sunday. If all goes well, then it's up to the other factors like the state, the federal government, and shipping companies to get that vaccine out to Americans as quickly as possible. As COVID-19 continues to ravage the country, Americans getting a vaccine could stop the spread in its tracks. So we do have a favorable vote, and that concludes this portion of the meeting. From the FDA to the CDC, where a committee there must also give the vaccine a green light. And if that happens... 20 million people should get vaccinated in just the next several weeks. So here's how Pfizer-BioNTech says it'll happen. Within 24 hours of the FDA's emergency authorization, much of the vaccine will be shipped from Pfizer's facility in Michigan. First, going to hospitals and pharmacies nationwide that partner with the federal government. Next, healthcare workers and residents in long-term care facilities are at the top of the list to get the vaccine. But that timeline could depend on which state you live in. Take Illinois, for example. Yes, there are a lot of people in that priority group, and yes, we want to make sure we get it to you, but no, it won't happen on day one or week one or maybe even week two. So patience will be the name of the game. So for younger, relatively healthy, non-essential workers. End of March, early April. Once you get into April, probably full blast with those individuals. Some details are still being ironed out, but the goal is to make it as simple as getting a seasonal flu shot. They'll come in at their scheduled time. They'll meet with the pharmacist or technician. They'll get a record card with the vaccination that they that they got. Um, we'll also email them that record. The Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, says it was going to give priority to those flights that are carrying the vaccine. So this will be a big effort done by UPS and FedEx by air and on the ground to get the vaccine out to different hospitals all across the country. From the White House, I'm Nadia Romero. And the vaccine could arrive in San Diego County by next week. CVS Health is looking to hire more than 100 pharmacy workers to help deliver those first doses. KPBS reporter Matt Hoffman says the county is working with employers to target initial vaccinations for the most at risk. Initial vaccine distributions will be focused on health care workers, specifically county health officials say those in acute care, psychiatric and correctional facility hospitals. We're limited by the amount of vaccine that we receive uh, from the county. Sharp Healthcare is one of the local hospital systems expecting first doses of the vaccine. County officials say they've ordered around 28,000 doses. Sharp isn't exactly sure how many they're going to get yet, but they will be going to people working in emergency departments and our ICUs, uh, urgent care areas, um, you know, the, the, the folks who are most at risk. Sharp officials say they have thousands of frontline workers in San Diego County eligible for first vaccinations. We will get the communication out to our employees and have them schedule themselves so it's not mandatory um, up to the extent that we have uh, enough vaccine. Many other local hospital systems, including Rady Children's, Scripps Healthcare, Palomar Health, and UC San Diego Health, are finalizing vaccine plans for frontline workers. The vaccine is two doses, just like the hepatitis A shot, and officials say for now it's not a replacement for wearing masks or social distancing. We, we do not know well uh, how long the immunity lasts. Um, 
and, and for that reason, too, we're encouraging people who have had COVID-19 uh, to also get vaccinated. Um, we're still learning a lot about this virus. It could take more than a month to vaccinate all frontline health care workers. After that, doses will be prioritized for those in assisted living facilities and first responders. Health officials have said it could take until March or April for vaccines to be available for all Americans. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. A historic day for San Diego. The city officially has a new mayor and new city council. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says Mayor Todd Gloria is promising a productive first 100 days. Hi, Todd Gloria. Do solemnly swear. Gloria's swearing in this morning took place entirely online via Zoom. The new mayor noted the significance of his ascension to the city's highest office. He's both the first non-white and openly gay person to be elected mayor. He also promised in his first 100 days to move past what he called small issues that past leaders have struggled to resolve. To accomplish that, let's be done with saying that we're just America's finest city. It's time for us to dare to be a truly great city. A city where your zip code doesn't determine your destiny. City Attorney Mara Elliott and a majority, five out of nine city council members, were also inaugurated. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. Unless the San Diego Unified School District receives more state and federal assistance, it will face a massive budget deficit heading into the next school year. KPBS education reporter Joe Hung explains how the district is working to balance its post-pandemic finances. The county's largest school district has been able to scrape by financially during the pandemic thanks to money from the CARES Act that the U.S. Congress passed in March. But without another injection of cash from the federal government and additional support from the state, San Diego Unified projects a $155 million budget deficit for the 2021-2022 school year. Richard Barrera is the vice president of San Diego Unified's board of trustees. If we had new federal stimulus, if we had a cost of living adjustment for this year and next, that would wipe away you know, that entire $155 million uh, shortfall. But we'll obviously know more, you know, uh, over the next, you know, probably six weeks. But district officials have reason to be optimistic. Brewer said he doesn't expect any layoffs this year. This is due in part to the 370 district employees who took buyout offers from the district. And with Joe Biden entering the White House and higher than expected tax revenues in California, Barrera said the current deficit projection is a very conservative estimate. We certainly expect, you know, that we're going to see, um, you know, an improvement in the revenue picture that will bring that number down. That being said, Barrera said he expects public schools to remain underfunded. And in the aftermath of the pandemic, he said public education will need more resources than ever. And that will be likely a multi-year challenge that we're going to see after we come out of the pandemic. So, you know, this issue again of the, you know, the, underfund, the chronic underfunding of public education in California is still very much with us. Joe Hong, KPBS News. Unemployment claims in the U.S. have hit their highest level since mid-September. Today, the Labor Department reported another 853,000 Americans filed for first-time unemployment benefits last week on a seasonally adjusted basis. That is the third increase in the past four weeks. Under the pandemic unemployment assistance program, that helps people like the self-employed. Nearly 428,000 workers filed claims. Continued jobless claims rose to 5.8 million with seasonal adjustments. New numbers obtained by KPBS show that evictions are continuing in San Diego County, despite a state bill meant to stop many of them during the pandemic. KPBS reporter Max Rivlin Nadler was in virtual housing court this morning. San Diego Superior Court Judge John S. Meyer heard cases virtually on Thursday morning as a landlord attempted to get a tenant evicted. The landlord and their attorney were claiming that the tenant hadn't paid their full security deposit back in June. Under a state law passed this summer, tenants don't have to pay their full rent, just 25% of it from September onwards. But there's nothing about unpaid security deposits. Legal aid attorney Alyssa Martinez argued that the tenant couldn't be evicted under the new state law. But Judge Meyer wasn't so sure. This was about a security deposit, not rent and declared a mistrial. So both parties will try again. 
Tenant advocates say the case is typical of some of the ways that landlords are trying to evict tenants despite the state law. The evictions have been um, an attempt to uh, evict folks because of, uh, usually because of fault, like there is a, uh, there's been a breach uh, other than non-payment. There's been a breach of the lease, uh, things like that. Since the previous statewide eviction moratorium expired in September, the San Diego County Sheriff's Department tells KPBS it has assisted in 156 evictions through the end of November, with those numbers ticking up in the past month. Noel says tenants are more motivated to stay in their homes right now as available affordable units run thin. There's no place to go right now. I mean, the, the, the real problem is that unless you know somebody on the private market, Max, unless you, you have a way to go, just showing up, being homeless and applying uh, for some random apartment is not going to get it done. It's, there's just not a lot of stock available. With no federal relief for landlords in months, the situation for many of them has become dire. But tenants are in the same boat as COVID-19 cases continue to rise and finances get stretched even further. Many are hoping to avoid an eviction crisis during a public health disaster. And until more help arrives, tenants and landlords will continue their desperate fights in court. Max Erlin Adler, KPBS News. There is no longer any doubt about what happened to a La Mesa police officer caught on camera grabbing and shoving a black man. That officer was fired. The city of La Mesa announced an appeals board upheld the termination of Matthew Dages. Up until now, the city had only said that he was no longer employed. He was fired after an investigation into the arrest of Amari Johnson in May. Charges were dismissed against Johnson, who sued for discrimination, excessive force and wrongful arrest. President-elect Joe Biden made his choice about who he wants to lead one of the most challenging agencies in the government. Biden selected Dennis McDonough for Secretary of Veterans Affairs. McDonough was a longtime chief of staff to former President Barack Obama. He was also worked as deputy national security advisor. Several veterans groups were hoping Biden would choose a veteran of the Iraq or Afghanistan wars. McDonough did not serve in the military. A new report finds veterans are struggling to file claims for VA benefits during the pandemic. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh says many vets are being improperly denied because they cannot get to a doctor. Mark Session got a late start. He was 34 years old when he entered Navy boot camp. Like many vets, he has lingering issues from his time in the service, especially with his back. He's been wrestling with the VA benefits process since he retired in 2017. This year, during the pandemic, the real issue for the Chula Vista vet has been getting in to see a doctor. Um, I initially scheduled in uh, February, and then it was uh, rescheduled to September, and then September to um, October, and then October they finally scheduled, uh, got it scheduled for November. Even in a normal year, Session says the VA claims process is long and exhausting. It's very frustrating because I want this whole you know, situation to be over, you know, to finally not have to be worried about any more exams or having to, you know, contact my attorney and stuff like that. It's just, um, just want to be done with it and get out of the way. And um, Beginning in April, the VA shut down all in-person appointments. Everything moved online, including doctor's appointments. The backlog of exams ballooned to 1.5 million during the pandemic. A new report by the VA's Inspector General also says thousands of claims were improperly denied. This after VA leadership declared that no vet should have their claim denied because it wasn't safe to see a doctor. Sessions attorney Casey Walker once worked for the VA. As he puts it, some VA employees just didn't get the memo. And then you got to keep in mind, at the same time, a lot of these a lot of these employees work from home for the first time ever, many of them not being too capable with their technology from home. They've always worked at the regional office their entire lives. VA may require an in-person examination as part of the claim process. The VA made the backlog worse, Walker says, by telling outside mental health providers that they could not evaluate their patients remotely when it came to filling out VA benefit claims. 
At the same time, the VA was telling its own doctors and contractors to only see patients using telehealth. Then almost in the same month, they said you must do all mental health exams by telehealth means. And I thought, what gives here? The VA's website shows nearly all of the country is open for in-person exams to some degree to chip away at the backlog of 1.5 million exams. Maura Clancy handles veterans' benefits appeals for Chisholm, Chisholm & Kilpatrick, a national firm based in Rhode Island which has clients in San Diego. I have noticed more examination reports coming in. So I know that they are working on the exams that were pending throughout the pandemic. And so that's a start. Instead of scheduling new visits, she says the VA should also lean more heavily on using existing medical records, at least for now. The VA told their inspector general that they are looking at cases denied during the pandemic. That shouldn't count on their cases being reopened, Clancy says. Instead, that should assume they'll have to step up on their own and file an appeal. Um, it only helps the, the case, I think to be able to point to what VA's guidance was in the beginning of the pandemic, which was that th those denials weren't supposed to happen. Um, and hopefully that they will take some corrective action. The VA has been trying to clear away the backlog of benefits claims for years. A new law went into effect a year before the pandemic designed to speed up the process. According to advocates who helped guide veterans through the process, juggling the new system and the pandemic probably created more cracks in the system. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. A smartphone app that will alert you if you've spent time near someone who tests positive for coronavirus is now available. The free app, which was first used at UC San Diego, is now available for Apple and Android devices. It's called CA Notify. State officials say the tool doesn't track people's identities or locations, but uses Bluetooth wireless signals to detect when two phones are within six feet of each other for at least 15 minutes. With a COVID-19 vaccine on the way, doctors are warning against online scams. Since March, healthcare professionals at UC San Diego say fake products promoted to cure or prevent the virus have surged. Everything from herbal supplements to phony testing kits, now it's fake vaccines. Experts say you may not only get ripped off and risk exposing your credit card information or identity stolen, but you could get hurt. You cannot get any vaccine on the internet. That's it. If you are getting a post or you're getting, um, you're seeing a post that says you can buy it right away, pre-order it, get it easy, just DM me or contact me on WhatsApp. It's not real vaccine. You get a product that is spoiled or somewhat adulterated. You get a needle that's not sterile. And then you could get infected by another disease or you could also, you know, get something that's actually toxic for your body. So the bottom line is that you cannot buy the vaccine online and it won't be widely available anytime soon. If you are looking for information, your best bet is an official government website. The pandemic has brought so many changes to how we live our lives. Among the most difficult, how people of faith live out their faith without being able to gather in the ways that they did before. On this first night of Hanukkah, KPBS reporter John Carroll shows us how one rabbi is leading his people through uncharted waters. As soon as the pandemic hit in March, Rabbi Yerucham Eilfert knew the way he'd done things for years would have to be different at the synagogue he leads, Chabad at La Costa in Carlsbad. People are going to need our support and we're going to have to change how we offer that. Pre-pandemic, everything that happened here centered around this building. Rabbi Eilfert, or Rabbi E, as most people call him, gathered with fellow rabbis and lay leaders to chart a new path to deliver an ancient message. And people are going to need the strength, the uh, inspiration that they get from the teachings of the Torah, from the Jewish Bible, from Judaism, more than ever before. So how do we bring it to them. That meant thinking out of the box. In a bit of holiday irony, thinking outside the box here at Chabad at La Costa has meant using actual boxes. This year, they're delivering Hanukkah in a box. This is the menorah. This is what we light on Hanukkah. The boxes also contain dreidels and gelt. That's Yiddish for money. In this case, chocolate coins. 
Rabbi E. says he's not taking the approach of certain houses of worship, fighting health orders, limiting how many people can gather inside. But he's wary of politicians, as he says, getting comfortable with certain regulations. It all comes down to what safety means. Maybe I would be safer never getting into my car. Maybe I should just stay in bed all day. But that's really not safer. Follow the law by all means. But you know what, guys? We've got we've to move this along also. We've got to find a way, help the science forward. It's never going to be 100% safe. Rabbi E admits the struggles of the COVID era have gotten him down from time to time. But when that happens, he says he thinks of the big picture. Again, I have a decision to make. Am I going to curse the darkness or am I going to try and kindle a light? As Hanukkah begins, the focus for Rabbi E's congregation, for Jews around the world, is light. In a metaphoric sense, the whole world looks to the light at the end of this dark tunnel, vaccines that will eventually lead to the end of the pandemic. But Rabbi E says even then, he won't forget the lessons learned during this difficult time, new ways to practice ancient traditions. I'm gonna focus on the God, be God-centered in my own life and try and inspire other people. That's what we're gonna do. John Carroll, KPBS News. And tomorrow, John will bring us the story of how San Diego's largest Muslim congregation and the imam that leads them is getting through the COVID crisis. Santa Claus came to town today, not in a sleigh, but an old town trolley. Thank you, Santa! You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Santa and Mrs. Claus arrived at Father Joe's Villages for the children's Christmas party. It was a little different this year, though, with touchless protocols for delivering gifts, hand sanitizer, of course, social distancing, and face coverings to keep everyone safe. This year is especially important because of the circumstances, and these kids are, are particularly bearing the brunt of that, um, emotionally and otherwise. And so just to add this sense of normalcy for them is so very, very important. Nearly 400 families in San Diego experience homelessness daily, including young children, such as those served by Father Joe's Village's therapeutic child care program. This year, more than 600 children have received critical services that address their behavioral, developmental, medical and dental needs. Quiet weather pattern for us for the next few days is onshore flow actually returns and yes will be a little bit warmer as we venture into the weekend now as you look at the satellite and radar there's not a whole lot going on out in the pacific staying fairly quiet there if you look off towards the east though that's where the moisture is leaving parts of arizona new mexico dealing with rain and snow showers again this is all moving away from us so no problems there but has had some of that cooler influence in some locations chula this says we head through tonight 50 for your low and as you look forward to borrego springs we're talking about 41 for the low there will be some clouds out there especially towards the coast as we head into the evening hours and overnight tonight there's at least some moisture with a little bit of fog venturing again mostly towards our coastal locations so you work your way further through the interior things are going to become quieter heading through tomorrow. We've still got sunshine out there in many locations. A little bit of that coastal cloud activity for the morning, then that will fade away as we go through the day and temperatures back to the mid 60s for the city. For the coast here, we do have temperatures holding on to the 60s, climbing into the lower 70s by the time we head into Sunday. It's looking dry, quiet for the next few days. And the good news is for most of our locations here, we're not too worried about winds. Things will be again staying quiet. Clouds giving way to sunshine as we head through the afternoon for your Friday. Temperatures in the lower 60s inland. Heading into the mountains, notice no problems. Temperatures in the 50s to begin with, but by Sunday, we could make it into the lower 60s. It'll be short lived though. We'll find some of that cool air trying to slide back in for Monday and Tuesday and in the desert itself. Those temperatures holding on to the low upper 60s, making it to the mid 70s by the time we head into Sunday and Monday, a quiet stretch through the end of the weekend and into next work week. For KPBS News, I'm AccuWeather meteorologist Melissa Constanzer. Scientists believe they've discovered a new species of whale off Baja, California. The scientists led by the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society took this underwater video and recorded acoustic signals from three whales. 
Experts now say they're highly confident the video actually shows an entire new species. Scientists are using genetic sampling to confirm that theory. Four astronauts who graduated from universities here in San Diego are among those tapped for the next mission to the moon. NASA formally named 18 astronauts to Project Artemis. Among them is Jessica Meir, who recently returned from a trip to the International Space Station, and Kate Rubens, who is currently on her second mission. Both received degrees from UC San Diego. Matthew Dominic and Johnny Kim are training for their first missions to space. Both attended University of San Diego. And Jupiter and Saturn are getting together for the holidays. On December 21st, which is the winter solstice, the two will appear so closely aligned in the sky that they will look like a double planet. It's called a conjunction, and one like this hasn't happened since the Middle Ages. Now to see it, you look low in the western sky for about an hour after sunset each evening between December 16th and Christmas. I'm Judy Woodruff tonight on the News Hour, getting the vaccine, a key vote on whether the U.S. will start getting shots next week, coming up at 7, right after Evening Edition on KPBS. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Have a great evening. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.